A welcome in to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm your host, Dion Rabowin. It is Thursday, September 30th, 2021. And I have with me the always cool, the always five, but especially stylish today, Darius <laughs> Dale, CEO of 42 Macro. Darius, what's going on? Not much, man. I'm, I'm changing my name to Salt Bay. He's back. You got you to gotta <laughs> buy stocks, man. Salt Bay is back. When Salt Bay is back, you got to buy stocks. Darius is going to explain what that means, because I don't understand, but he's going to break it down for us. Uh, why, when Salt Bay is back, you got to buy stocks. We're also talking earnings reports today. Bed Bath & Beyond dropping some Blood bad Bath news on the markets. Bloodbath in the markets. We are down the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, all in the red today. And we will be talking jobs, uh, initial jobless claims, and the outlook ahead on the economic front. But Darius, I want to start with, again, another day of red in the markets. Like I just said, we are down over 1% right now uh, on the Dow, at 1.5%, really, and down 1% on the S&P. The NASDAQ not dripping quite as much, down about half a percent. But what are you thinking here? What's the catalyst for these negative movements? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the earnings outlook is coming under question. And more importantly, it's coming under question right around the time where we have a, 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 per, a sea of a storm clouds really developing. If you look, obviously, with the debacle and the, the craziness going on down in D.C., you obviously have uh, we're a month closer to the start of the Fed's tapering program. And then, obviously, again, you have supply chain issues sort of weighing on both revenues and, and, uh, and obviously, uh, decreasing operating margins. So investors are quite concerned. Um, I do believe that that concern is it may be not as warranted, certainly at these prices. Um, we're at the low end of our probable range for that to be above 100. But I think the real key takeaway from my from in terms of all the analysis that we're producing at 42 Macro is that once you get past the operation monthly operations expiry on the 15th, because today was the quarterly operations expiry, I think it's going to be a, a smooth sailing from there throughout. You know, I think Q4 of 2021 could very much resemble Q4 of 2019 when the S&P was up 8.5%. Uh, yeah, yeah, the S and P. Uh, you when you say Q4 2019, that's got investors' ears perking up. I think because that was a very good quarter. Uh, I want to throw a little bit of shade on your sunshine, though, Darius. This Bed Go Bath and Beyond back earnings on. calls. <laughs> Darius put the he's putting the shades back on. He's those are his hater blockers. Yes. I'm gonna be a hater right now for just a second, Darius. But man, this earnings call for Bed Bath and Beyond was bad, and. I want to be clear, it wasn't just what they were saying about their company, right? Because, you know, we all know that companies are notorious on these earnings calls for trying to blame everything else under the sun except for management for some of these downturns. But they were talking about everything. They say they can't get materials. Prices are rising. They can't find employees. They've got empty shelves because of all these bottlenecks going on across the world. This seems like a negative for the entire retail industry. And as we know, retail is about 80% of the US economy. I wonder, is this a canary in the coal mine, Darius? Is this something that you're worried about in terms of being bad, not just for BBY, BBBY, but for the market overall? Yeah, so let me, uh, one quick uh, correction there. Uh, consumer spending is about 75% of the US economy. Retail is about a third of that. Um, Blood Bath & Beyond is a, is a terrible company. I don't think anybody would argue Oof. there. I don't, I don't do I don't do micro analysis at 42 macro, but I would argue that that's not a, a great harbinger of what uh, is going on in the economy. We know growth slow throughout Q3, right? I mean, you pull up the Atlanta Fed; uh, they were down at 3.5 last time I checked. This is last week. Um, I'm sure they're somewhere near there, isn't there about. And so the reality is, we've seen the impact of Delta, the peak impact of Delta. But what I think investors are missing, if they're staring at Bed Bath Bloodbath and Beyond today, Blood is the fact beyond. that growth is likely to bounce starting in Q4. Uh, we're going to see uh, high-frequency data bounce in October. We're much more highly likely to see that carry through uh, into November. And so you have this setup where you have high-frequency statistics and also low-frequency statistics like GDP, quarterly calendar, quarterly statistics, might actually show some acceleration in Q4. And I think that's exactly what the market's picking up on. Uh, we track a, you know, a, a myriad of inter- and intra-market dynamics at 42 Macro. And, and from an intra-market perspective, we're seeing a high beta, low beta breakout. We're seeing small cap, mega cap ratio. Looks like it wants to break out. Same thing with value to growth. Uh, we look at um, 50 different U.S. equity sectors and style factors daily uh, from a month-on-month -month sharp ratio dispersion analysis, which gives us a proxy for institutional flows. 
and 70 to 80 percent of the upper uh, upper quintile constituents out of those 50 are very clearly cyclical, and 90 percent of the lower quintile are very clearly defensive. So the market is very clearly rotating into a risk-on state, and you're missing that action if you're staring at Bed Bath and Beyond or the uh, S and P's price into a quarterly operation options expert. Mm, okay, all right, Darius Dale putting those sunglasses back on, and not forget, like, let me just ask you this before we move on. How does Salt Bay influence all this? Because as you said, he's back. Yeah, no, I think Salt Bay is a great proxy for people's willingness to take risk. I mean, if you're gonna spend, mm. I don't know, several thousand dollars on a steak for some Robert Downey Jr. lookalike to sprinkle salt on your hamburger <laughs> like this, the stock market's going higher. It's not going lower. I mean, this that, that's, that it is what it is. So uh, I, I'm obviously, you know, joking. You know, that's not a real feature of our analysis. But to me, I think the biggest thing that's happened in the last week that's given us a lot of confidence that the market can survive this sort of near-term two-week window of volatility that we expect between now quarterly op options expiry and uh, October 15th, which is um, which is the monthly op options expiry, just ahead of oh by the way, uh, Janet Yellen's uh, October 18th uh, debt limit uh, default uh, catalyst. So you could see some uh, some serious chopping and, and maybe some more volatility in between now and then. But the reality is, if we get past the debt ceiling, which we're likely to do, you know, we haven't defaulted yet as a country, um, and the and Biden's uh, fiscal agenda is not completely derailed, but more importantly, it's just mitigated. You know, you get the fiscal infrastructure bill, you get something that looks like 1.5 to 2 trillion from a headline perspective on the budget resolution. That's so positive. And it's positive for the reason you don't think it is. It's positive because it takes the wind out of long-term inflation expectations that I would argue are sort of pinned at the highs with respect to everyone's expectations for fiscal largesse. And so if we rein that in a bit, we're going to be able to sort of help fiscal policy piggyback on the positive dynamics that we're seeing coming out of the September FOMC. Uh, you know, from a near-term perspective, that meeting was quite hawkish. I mean, Powell more or less, you know, put it stuck his ears in his thing in, in his ears and said, "We're going to taper in November regardless." And so I think a lot of yeah. investors are anchoring on that in terms of the volatility that we're seeing there. But I think they're missing the broader takeaway, which is they're forecasting core PCE, their preferred inflation metric, to be above two percent as far as the eye can see, and, and certainly in two point three percent by the end of twenty or the average for twenty twenty three. But they're only forecasting the Fed funds rate to get to one percent. At, by the right. end of 2023. I mean, that's it. That's 130 basis points south of what they're projecting inflation to average in that year. So clearly, that was incredibly dovish. The, and, and, and when you look at rates curves, you know, we look at obviously everything in, in the Treasury bond market. But even when you start to dig, you know, you look at 20, 24 euro dollar spreads, you look at uh, medium term Fed funds rate expectations, looking at five year overnight index swap spreads, and then you look at five year, five year forward overnight index swap spreads. And, and, you know, as a proxy for terminal Fed fund rate expectations, and they're all meaningfully higher since the September FOMC. And the only reason those things would be meaningfully higher is because the market is the, the bond market, the rates market is saying, hey, this economic expansion has a longer tail to it now because we're more confident that the Fed will be structurally dovish as opposed to the Fed that we thought we got in, in the June FOMC, which was sort of pushing at, pushing back against that. Yeah, yeah. You're talking fiscal, you're talking monetary right there. I want to go to a clip right now because uh, we've got another gentleman who's got some thoughts on the environment that we're in, the macro environment, and how that relates to the economy. This is Deepak Jurnani, a managing partner at Versa Investments. He's talking to our own Jack Farley with this clip here on Real Vision. So check this out. And uh, um, I want to come back and get your thoughts on it, Darius. But this is Deepak Jurnani, managing partner at Versa Investments. We have had more than a decade of global monetary expansion, and investors have been concerned that the, both the global bond as well as the equity markets may be stretched, right? And uh, we, have, we have been seeing some volatility, certainly in the bond market uh, this year, uh, although equity markets have continued to trend higher, but the concern is there. So in, in such an environment, we do believe that a global macro strategy that is uncorrelated with bonds and stocks can offer significantly attractive opportunities from a portfolio diversification. That was Deepak Jurnani, managing partner at Verser Investments, talking about why he's bullish just like you are, Darius. Now, you talked through some of the 
fiscal policy for some of the reasons from the fiscal side that you're bullish, uh, the Biden agenda likely making it through, uh, continuation, moving past this debt limit battle that we seem to be locked in. I want to talk to you a little bit about the monetary side, the Fed. Uh, Jerome Powell, obviously an investor favorite, Mr. $120 billion a month of QE, uh, Mr. Rate Reversal from the automatic pilot interest rate increases in 2018. Uh, the market likes this guy. Uh, Senator Liz Warren said at Senate testimony the other day, I think it was yesterday or Tuesday, Tuesday it was, that she will not support his reconfirmation for Fed chair. There's been a lot of pat banging from the liberal wing of the Democratic Party uh, that maybe Jerome Powell's not the guy. Maybe they want someone like a Governor Lael Brainerd. What are your thoughts about how that, along with two key retirements uh, from two Fed presidents after this little scandal about them trading uh, REITs and, you know, making some we'll trades that call them you know, were perfectly legal, but, uh, you know, maybe didn't look so great. How do you feel like and what position does that put Fed Chair Jay Powell in right now when the market really needs him? Yeah, I mean, I think it really just uh, so for one, I, going back to this list of thing, I think it's real. Uh, I do believe that there is, as you said, a faction of the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party that believes that the Fed is is either doing too much in terms of inflating asset prices or not doing enough in terms of, you know, sort of uh, orchestrating macroprudential policy that might favor certain, you know, uh, communities in, the, in, the, in, in within American society. Uh, the reality is that he, the guy's got an impossible job, right? You, you're talking about trying to address things like racism and things in our society that, you know, require much bigger solutions than a monetary policy can can really get you. So I think that's an I think it is a real issue that would obviously destabilize markets in terms of removing what I think has been a very calm, calming influence over asset markets and really a great suppressor of volatility, a great tightener of credit spreads um, in this man, Jay Powell, because he's obviously done an excellent job of managing uh, throughout the crisis. Mm, very interesting. So do you expect that we're going to see four more years of Powell, or do you think right now he's facing too much? I think Biden's got way too much on his plate to worry about destabilizing financial markets right now by removing or by not uh, reappointing uh, Jay Powell. Now, I don't know how much sort of it's unclear at this current juncture how much sort of um, uh, the strength in numbers uh, Senator Warren may have in terms of her view on not wanting to reappoint Powell. I just assume, and I, obviously I believe the market does as well, believe that Powell gets uh, reappointed. Or at the bare minimum, it'll be someone who's very similar in terms of their monetary policy framework and, and their likely uh, commitment to the Fed's current forward guidance, which is all that really matters. As, as I mentioned, the bond market, the rates market are reflating since the September FOMC. They deflate it post the June FOMC, right? You go back to August uh, Jackson Hole of 2020, the Fed adopted an average inflation targeting framework, and that was used as a, as a foil so they could really adopt what they really wanted was a maximum and inclusive employment uh, framework. And so, you know, th from that point to all the way through the June FOMC, where they uh, raised the dot plot, um, they, they hiked the dot plot, the, the market and, and all the investors in the entire global world effectively thought the Fed had pivoted towards MMT. Well, in that June FOMC meeting and, and that catalyst really sort of took the wind out of the sails of that expectation. It took the wind out of the sails of some what had been at that point, uh, some very crowded reflation trades. And I think what you're starting to see now is the signs that reflation is starting to come back on. Now, you know, the speed with which we see an acceleration in something like energy prices may actually ultimately derail that. But I still think we're probably earlier in that, that movie than we are later, because, again, the things that I mentioned about high beta, low beta, small cap, mega cap, value to growth, the cyclical leadership in our dispersion analysis, the defensive laggard ship in that analysis, those things are all very new as of like the last couple of weeks. You know, we go back mm -hmm. from basically early June all the way through the last few weeks. It's been defense, 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 defense. And right now we have an equity market and a credit market that underneath the surface is really trying to get back on to offensive. And what's catalyzing that, in my opinion, again, you have very favorable net liquidity dynamics out of D.C. The Fed's not going to start tapering to November. And even if they do, we're still going to get, I don't know, 95 or $100 billion of QE that month. Uh, the, the, Janet Yellen's going to take the—it's the, likely to take the Treasury general account all the way down to close to zero from 200—a little bit north of $200 billion now. That's net positive from a net liquidity perspective. And more importantly, it's very unlikely, just based on reading the tea leaves from this week and last, that Biden gets that $3.5 trillion number. And the smaller and smaller that package gets— the less and less debt, the bully, we've been talking about the bully on this program for a few months in terms of the Treasury sitting at the top of the global capital structure, that's the, the less and less money the bully is going to demand when he comes to take our lunch money. So um, that is all very positive. 
But I think one other dynamic that I sort of alluded to is also quite positive is the world's sort of rolling past Delta. Like the, the, the peak, the Bed Bath & Beyond told you everything the economic statistics throughout the third quarter have told you in terms of all the leading survey data, PMIs, consumer confidence, business confidence. All these things are telling you that Delta had impact economically. Whether or not we saw lockdowns or anything else, we saw society and consumer and business behavior change. Now, if we see those statistics start to roll, and they, have, they certainly are rolling, Delta has peaked. We're going to see the data bounce in October. It's likely to have followed through in November, and that's likely to continue to have market impact, particularly around an investor consensus that is generally or generally nervous about risk. You know, you look at something like the CNN Fear and Greed Index. That's at 26 right now. We're just off of a, where are we five percent off an all-time high, and it's at 26. You know, this was at 53 a month ago, but that's not even a great metric. I mean, you look at you know something like the the median eyeball premium and implied volatility premium across the 37 ETF exposures that we track every day, liquid ETF exposures with liquid options, you know, that's at 27 percent. You know, we tend to think anything north of 33 percent on that metric is actionable. So we're starting to get to a place where investor consensus is really quite nervous about everything, like looking backwards. And I think looking ahead into Q4, you know, and potentially all the way through Q4, uh, the outlook is actually quite favorable, much like we saw in, in Q4 2019. Hmm. Now, that's you know, Darius, like you said, you're bullish, and we are on a downswing, though, right now in the stock market. I think what you're saying is, you know, it might be BTFD time by the freaking dips. Uh, go yeah, ahead. I'll, I'll say you, you can buy the dip today, but I think you have to do that in, with keeping in mind that, hey, look, these, 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 this sort of storm cloud of catalysts with the sector earnings with respect to the debt ceiling and then with respect to sort of the, the fiscal policy dynamics of what will get passed and what won't get passed— like that's going to be an issue for the next few weeks. And so if you buy the dip now, you'd be ready to sell the rip at some point uh, in the next week or so, because again, you could get some headline risk that takes you back down lower. But the reality is, you know, we're seeing a lot of positive dynamics with respect to, you know, inner and intra market dynamics, but you're also starting to see data support a lot of what I'm saying now. I mean, we spent an entire, what, two months all being freaked out. Not weeks, I'd say, I'd say the very get go, Evergrande is not even. <laughs> You can fact check me on that. But a lot of people yeah. in the last two months yelling about Evergrande and Chinese PMIs went up in September. I mean, think about that. They went mm -hmm. up. Now, I'm not saying they're going to go up sustainably. I still think China's um, economic slowdown, this trending deceleration, is likely to actually accelerate to the downside in Q4, mostly as a function of the, you know, the lagged impact of macroprudential tightening. You see uh, monetary policy neutrality. You're actually starting to see it get tighter at the margins relative to where it was a couple weeks ago. And so the reality is China's not out of the woods yet, but we think, I would argue in terms of the PBOC's meeting last night with 24 banks and a lot of different regional um, 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 executives, they basically cut off the left tail of the Chinese economic distribution. They cut off the left tail of financial sector contagion, and they basically said, look, we're not going to grow as fast, but we're not going to crash either. And that's positive in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and when you say left tail, you're talking about those left tail risks, basically kind of those uh, big potential black swan events. Now, we know the market's down today, the stock market's down today. What's up today is Bitcoin. And I want to take a couple questions from the exchange. That's Real Vision social platform. Uh, and we, we're going to be taking some more of those. So if you got a question for Daily, Darius, go ahead and hit up the exchange, drop your questions there. I'm going to take a couple questions on the same topic. Uh, one from Mutcher. I apologize if I butchered your name. Uh, and one from Devin T. Uh, Mutcher asks, hey, Darius, what's your outlook for Bitcoin in Q4? Uh, Devin T, a similar question. Darius, do you still think that Bitcoin could run to 100,000 by the end of the year? Uh, the answer to the question is that, the second question. <laughs> Why wouldn't it? Like, if we're, if, if, if we're half, if we're 70% right on a lot of what we're saying, because again, there's always a forecast error. Don't let anybody, just for folks watching at home, don't let any of these talking heads, no matter how pretty I might be or pretty they might be, don't let them get on these programs to confuse you. There is always forecast error. This is why we work so hard every morning to be Bayesian and update our models, update our projections very incrementally. So going back to this view on Bitcoin, I'm the idiot that didn't realize seasonality was such a negative factor in Bitcoin, you know, um, you know, throughout the month of September. But I do believe there are investors today front running the, the positive 
seasonality that we're like the that may, we're likely to experience you know sometime in October. If we're right on these net liquidity dynamics, we're right on growth bouncing, we're right on China cutting off the left tail risk and just moving to the background in terms of Bitcoin headline risk in general, then yeah, Bitcoin's going to go up a lot. Ethereum's going to go up a lot. You could see some more speculation. Don't forget, we have a lot of cash on the sidelines. If you look at $1.3 trillion of reverse repo, $4.6 trillion of money market funds on the sidelines, who knows what the you know ultimate buying uh, power is for the re the you know the emboldened retail investor that you know continues to support the market with this dip buying activity. You know, there's if if we start to see some bubbly charts, and you typically do, right? Like go back to um, uh, Q4 17 into January 2018, and then you go back into Q4 19 into January 22 2020. Whenever the VIX starts to rise alongside the S and P 500, you tend to see a blow off top associated with that. And the reason that is a the reason that occurs is because people continue to overpay for protection on the way up, and the dealers have to sell them that protection. As the market goes up, they cover that protection, and it really starts to feed on itself and manifests itself. And I'm certainly and what I'm effectively saying is a lot of the policy and growth dynamics that I've highlighted can all really start to come to a head and, and perpetuate a very similar setup in Q4 heading into Q1 of next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. That's definitely certain. Excuse me. That's definitely something to watch in that Bitcoin, that cryptocurrency market that I know a lot of Real Vision viewers are watching very closely. Want to shift gears a little bit and talk to you a little bit about commodities. We saw a big bounce in gold today, a much less big bounce in silver. Gold, I think, doubling its loss from yesterday. Silver getting about half of its loss from yesterday back, and then over into oil. You mentioned oil earlier on when we were talking about potential risks for this equity rally. Uh, WTI rallying over $75 a barrel today. Uh, Brent crude rallying over $78 a barrel today. Both seem to just be moving incrementally higher. I think Brent closed a little bit lower, but still over that $78.50 mark right now. I mean, are we getting into worrisome territory when it comes to gold? And what is your outlook on the commodities and what the, that market's telling us right now? Yeah, I think that's the number one downside risk for risk assets in general is the speed with which commodities reprice higher, particularly the energy complex. You know, because it's really not you're not going to see it. In my opinion, you're probably it's unlikely you see broad based commodity rallies like every commodity chart up like we saw in the first half of the year because you don't have the Chinese growth dynamics there to support it, nor do you have the sort of broad you know monetary and fiscal policy dynamics to support that. However, the world is very clearly short oil, and it's as a function very clearly short of that gas, and those charts reflect that. And so, to me, you could actually get to a place as you know. As, let's say everything. Let's say let's go back to the scenario where seventy-five percent or sixty to seventy-five percent of what I said is right, and it's you know late Q4, stock markets up, Bitcoin's up, oil's up a lot, net gas is up a lot. At some point, those dynamics are going to really start to erode invest or erode investor confidence because they're going to start to really perpetuate higher short-term and medium-term inflation expectations that may actually catalyze. A pull forward or an acceleration of tapering may actually catalyze, you know, a, a sort of a you know, risk off moment in the financial market. So, to me, I think you got to watch that that level closely. I'd be lying if I said I had a specific number that will catalyze risk off, you know, in terms of, um, you know, really, uh, you know, giving us that signal. But you know, to, you know, 42 macro regime oriented investors, right now, the dominant market regime is what we call inflation. And so, obviously, it's you know pricing in that inflation, at least on an expectations basis, and in the commodities market, um, is likely to continue higher. But right now, it's a very low conviction. It's in a low conviction state. And what I mean by that, the metric that we use to track conviction in any one of the four grid regimes, uh, Goldilocks, reflation, inflation, and deflation, uh, is you know it's only in the ninth percentile of all you know daily daily readings going back to January 1998. And so what that tells me is that the market understands that we're in this inflation trade, which may turn out to be a reflation trade, which ultimately may give way back to a real high conviction inflation trade, which would actually be risk off. So, um, you know, if you're talking to me in three months, if that didn't happen and I got it all wrong, sue me. <laughs> but if not, uh, you know, get some experience with that. <laughs> but at, at any rate, uh, that's that's kind of our that's our view. Yeah, Darius, you talk about inflation, reflation. I'm going to take one more question from the exchange, and that's from Ronald Welch. He asks, is stagflation a possibility? What do you think? Yeah, so looking longer term, I certainly believe that the, 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 the stationary mean of most inflation time series in the U.S., headline CPI, core CPI, core PCE, et cetera, has transposed high. On the core side, probably somewhere between 50 to 75 basis points. 
on the headline side, probably somewhere between 100 and 150 basis points, which means the cycles that we have, the rate of change cycles and inflation, will just be taking place higher. Now, we're unlikely to figure that out as investors until inflation statistics bottom in the latter part of next year. Like, they're likely to bottom and start to reaccelerate um, in, you know, Q3, Q4 of 2022 at levels that are much higher than we've historically bottomed, or at least in the post-GFC in the post -GFC era. And so, to me, I think that is a, a real risk longer term. I think in the short term, like over the next couple of months, reflation is the highest probability risk, right? You're talking about in, uh, great growth accelerating. It may actually pull up some inflation statistics. And if you look at the year-over-year -year comps for stuff like core CPI and core PC, actually October and November are actually quite easy. Uh, so you could see a little bit of a marginal uptick in inflation statistics, but again, neither of those things are going to trend. You're talking about a transitory bounce in growth, and you're talking about flat to down to up, you know, mostly sideways inflation statistics over the next couple of months. And to me, I think that's if in the backdrop of, of a support of monetary and fiscal policy. Again, once we get past this, you know, this OPEX cycle, I think those things are positive. Hmm. Okay. So you're saying don't write off stagflation, but it's not an immediate concern in terms of your view. Yeah, that to me, that to me is when we, I think, again, I'm going to lick my finger and put a, a number in the air and, and, and say, hey, at $90 WTI, I think stagflation will be the only thing that matters to asset markets, because you're talking about going from $15 billion a month on tapering to probably something like 30 or 40 um, that to me is, is the real risk. Again, I don't know if it's 90 or 85. To me, it's just what, what are inflation expectations doing as a response to that? And right now, inflation expectations, at least coming out of this, this September FOMC catalyst, they've been pretty, pretty stable relative to everything else, relative to nominal rates, relative to real rates, relative to euro dollar spreads, relative to uh, overnight index swap spreads. And so to me, the market is saying, hey, like, this structurally dovish Fed has given us more scope to reflate or to grow economically, but it's not necessarily saying it's bleeding into inflation yet. And at some point, that's going to be an issue. I just don't think it's an issue today, like a lot of investors believe it is. I mean, you look at SKU, it's at 10 right now on a, on a 25 delta basis. I mean, it's only gotten there, you know, since, you know, the first, before, first quarter of what, this year, it's only gotten there one or two other times. That was last Monday and on May 12th. So, you know, that those are obviously buying opportunities, and, and we certainly think that was this uh, this one is too. too, too. All right, Darius. I'm going to throw one last thing at those hater blockers in your bullish forecast, and that's this initial jobless claims number that we got today. 362,000 initial jobless claim numbers. Third straight week, the numbers have gone up, and, and every single week, economists have expected them to go down. We are now at, I believe, a two-month high on these initial jobless claims, seven-week high, excuse me, seven-week high on initial jobless claims. 362,000. Are you just writing that off? I'm not writing it off, but I mean, it's, it's, I think we've proven how poor of a metric this thing is. I mean, like, if you want to find out what's going on in the labor market, you got to do a little bit more work than the Thursday morning initial jobless claims. I mean, you know, we're looking at things like the drawdown and in, in employment to population ratios for prime working age adults. We're looking at the drawdown mm -hmm. in the size of the labor force for different cohorts. We're looking at, you know, different um, un unemployment statistics and employment statistics for different ethnic cohorts. You know, we're looking at the same things that Jay Powell's looking at. And to me, I think all those things are, you know, they're telling you that this is a Fed that has to commit to remaining structurally dovish, which it did, which opens up the door for a mini reflation trade in Q4, which remains our base case scenario. So, Sorry about, sorry about the initial jobless claims, man. I'm sorry for any, whoever's filing. I mean, you know, we're hiring, so uh, send us an email. <laughs> All right, 42 Macker is hiring. You heard that here first on Real Vision from Darius Dale, founder and CEO of 42, of 42 Macro. So keep, keep your eyes there. And look, that is going to do it for the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I, again, want to thank my guest, Darius Dale. Great as always. Darius, thanks so much for being with us. Tian, always a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys tuning in. And the pleasure was all mine. I want to thank all of you out there who joined us today for the daily briefing. Come back tomorrow. We will do it. We will be doing it again as soon as the market closes. You can catch us right here on Real Vision. Tune in and we'll see you then.